Greetings, brothers and sisters. Um, I want to dispel this idea that I guess is now sort of infiltrated into the so-called truth community, that Johnny Depp is some sort of the hero, the good guy, you know, in this thing with Amber Heard. I've already talked about Amber Heard fake crying in, a, you know, in her um, whatever testimony she gave, and that um, she reminds me of my ex in various ways, mannerisms and some of the acting, some of the ways that she portrays herself as a victim. I mean, there's some similarities here to my own personal situation, right? Something that I went through. And I've talked about the victim as abuser, the victim, a person who is constantly a victim, constantly being a victim and seeking, a, you know, having a victim stance and seeking sympathy from others. I've read that quote many times. Let me see if I can find it here. I should know it by heart by now. The victim stance is a powerful one. The victim is always morally right, neither responsible nor accountable, and forever entitled to sympathy. And I've said this so many times before. In every abuser, there's a victim. In every victim, there's an abuser, right? So when you're in this dynamic, a person has both the abuser and the victim inside their internal world. And, you know, I often talk about the internal world being such a, uh, you know, important and essential part of everything, right? It's, it really matters what you have on the inside. And this, of course, has to do with my heartfulness meditation. What's inside of you? What kind of person are you on the inside? I mean, that's what's essential and important. So if I was to look at this through my own personal experience, I would side with Johnny Depp or identify with him. And, you know, given just the way Amber Heard is and she's so unlikable, I would say that she's the problem, right? You know, if I had to pick sides and I couldn't see beyond my own limited personal experiences, right? Like when I, if I made everything about me and my own, you know, personal, you know, whatever it was, then I would say, oh yeah, Johnny Depp's a good guy and Amber Heard's the bad guy. I hope Johnny Depp wins. And that's the way we've been trained. You've been trained your whole life to pick sides, right? We live in a very binary system. And even if you like hate both Super Bowl teams, you're going to pick one of them, right? <laughs> if you want to watch the Super Bowl, you have to sort of pick one of them. Like if you're in, in the politics, you're going to pick somebody. Even if you you don't vote, you're going to like one person better than the other. You know, there's always going to be some level of having to pick a side, right? But that's completely imaginary. It doesn't exist. You don't have to pick a side. And really, why should you? <laughs> you know? especially in something like this where both people are clearly effed up and they have some sort of demonic and satanic connection, right? And, you know, I think they're both telling the truth about some of the stuff the other person did to them. They were caught in some, you know, ugly, hateful, hate-fest, demonic, violent relationship, and they both, you know, exhibited lower characteristics and tendencies you know war pulls out things I mean, they're caught in like a demon war and war pulls out the worst in people right and we can certainly see this in this case that's why it's really of no real importance or interest in to me because it's not like there's some redeemable person in this thing they're both um mired in it so let's talk about johnny depp because i think people have forgotten about who he was or who he is, right? <laughs> and who he is now. And so, um, you know, who, who he was in the past and who he is now. And now they're, you know, manufacturing some hero because everything falls along political lines or whatever. You know, you think uh, Johnny Depp is like Trump and, you know, like uh, Amanda Heard is like, I don't know, Biden or Hillary or something. And, you know, it's just, it's no way to go through life. Johnny Depp has had a long association with not only depraved people in the rock and roll industry and people in Hollywood. And so, you know, his own demonic connections and it's many dark movies about vampires and twisted, weird characters and all of it. Right. I mean, remember what he did to Willy Wonka, like the guy, one of the weirdest characters ever. But I'm going to focus on two people that he was close with. 
I mean, this is more than enough. But I could, you know, find all these various associates of Johnny Depp, and you say, oh, this guy is, um, you know, you can judge people who they hang out with and who they support. Johnny Depp was in a film with Roman Polanski called The Ninth Gate. Roman Polanski and Johnny Depp are pals. They hang out. Johnny Depp has verbalized his support for him, saying he's not a predator. We're going to go into this in a moment. Of course, Woody Allen was also a friend of John, uh, Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski, if you don't know, this is The Ninth Gate. He is a director. He makes really crappy films. And he made two films that were about Satanism. One was Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary was Mia Farrow, who was Woody Allen's former wife. And she was you know, young Mia Farrow, who gave birth to the, the Antichrist. And the other was The Ninth Gate, which was about the Ninth Gate of Hell. And Johnny Depp was starring in this movie. Roman Polanski was convicted of sexual abuse and giving drugs to a 13-year-old girl. And you can read what he did to her. He was convicted. He, you know, more or less admitted to it. And he was, um, instead of serving prison time here, he went and hid in Europe and didn't come back to America, right? And they have celebrated him in Hollywood. His films, like I said, two of them are about satanic worship being a satanist and you can tell somebody from their art right somebody who has a twisted inside and he has a fascination with satanism but there was another movie i watched of his i think it's called carnage it's about two couples and one of the couples in new york city even though he wasn't allowed there and one of the couple's sons smacks um had hit another son with like a uh you know like a hockey stick or something in the face and broke his face or something. And the two couples meet and they just get into this long, superficial and just, I mean, I, I can't even explain how bad the conversation is. It uh, stars Jodie Foster and um, that uh, the foreign guy that's in a lot of the uh, Quentin Tarantino movies, the other stepbrother that's not Will Ferrell <laughs> and um, the girl from the... Um, a Titanic movie, and it's just horrible to watch. I would call that another um, satanic movie. The guy has a fascination with darkness and twisted human, you know, whatever it is, human expression of evil. Aside from um, his, uh, his being convicted, he was also married to Sharon Tate, and it was his house. When Sharon Tate was pregnant, she was killed by the Manson family, Roman Polanski was, you know, that was his wife, and they were, you know, murdered by this cult. So there's, the guy has just a, a long history of being a creepy m and So he's a convicted pedophile, right? A convicted pedophile, and he sexually abused this model who was somehow associated with a movie he was making, you know, a Hollywood thing, right? So he was a part of, how that was a Hollywood crime, you know, he's a convicted felon, and he fled justice, and he was living in Europe as a rich, wealthy person, right, for a number of years, and Hollywood has tried to come to his defense over and over again, various members of Hollywood want him to be allowed back into the States, and then on top of that, he was married to a woman, and when she was pregnant, she was involved in the Manson killings as a victim, right, Sharon Tate, he was married to Sharon Tate. Like, you know, so how much darkness does this guy have inside of him, right? Just think about just those two events and then look at all of his crappy work that he's put out. It's just saturated with evil. So with all of that, right, Johnny Depp goes, hey, I want to work with that guy, right? I want to make a movie about the ninth gate of hell with that guy. Here's a little video of the, the, the making of the ninth gate. A satanic text. The nine gates of the kingdom of shadows. And a it's the ninth kingdom of hell, right? This guy, Frank Langelina, or whatever his name is, he's been in all these horror movies. Obsessed millionaire. I want you to get it for me at all costs. A mercenary collector descends into a labyrinth of evil to face the ultimate seduction. The ninth gate. Okay, so um, that was uh, Roman Polanski's girlfriend who plays like a 
demonic angel that watches over Johnny Depp. Artisan Entertainment brings to the screen this haunting new thriller from award-winning director. It sucks. I mean, aside from being satanic, it sucks. The guy sucks at making movies. Director Roman Polanski. The Nine Gates is a book that plays the central part in the picture. It's the title of the book. It's the Nine Gates of the Kingdoms of Shadows. Only three copies survive. There's a pentagram. Only one is authentic. It's an ancient book which has supernatural power. Starring the versatile and critically acclaimed actor Johnny Depp. Of course. This was Johnny Depp at the height of his, you know, this was Johnny Depp when he was, you know, at the, the height of his career. And he could have worked with anybody, but he chose to work with Roman Polanski, right? He worked with lots of twisted directors, of course, Tim Burton, a lot of the things that he made. And just, you know, in general, Johnny Depp makes weird films and he plays bizarre characters. And he chose to associate himself with Roman Polanski, who was a convicted pedophile for a number of years. And Johnny Depp went over and worked with him, right? A guy who was basically banned by Hollywood, but Johnny Depp went and worked with him anyway. So he's a very charming guy, but you instantly get the feeling that there's something wrong. There's something uh, you don't like about him. I think course. Another, you know, example of this is what does Johnny Depp have on the inside that he creates all these twisted, weird characters? And, you know, he's uh, predisposed to all this darkness and wearing skulls and the skull rings and all the, the weird stuff that he does. He's just a weird dude. So he's very passionate about books, but he's also a hard-nosed business guy. Johnny's smile, you know, his charm and his wickedness sometimes, you know, combined. That's what Corso is in, in the novel. Cut it. So he just said that Johnny has this wickedness inside of him. <laughs> That's what Roman Polanski said about Johnny Depp, right? Very good. That's it. Thanks. I think within the first three minutes of a Polanski film, you feel some kind of uneasiness, uh, some kind of eeriness, a sense of instability in the center of your body, you know. And that's what attracted you to the, to the film and, and to him personally. The mood is pure Polanski. You know, it is so Roman and so completely in his head. Atmosphere. You mean a satanic pedo, right? It's an extremely important thing. That's what really makes you forget that you're sitting in the theater. I like the idea of hating a character initially, but then growing to like him. In the beginning, when you really dislike him, he's bad. But when you grow to like him at the end, he's in fact worse. So that was a very interesting thing he just said. That you dislike the guy because he's a scumbag in the beginning. But just as the movie goes along, he's a protagonist and you end up liking him because that's how movies work. Even though he becomes a much worse person, which I know because I saw this piece of crap. And he becomes a much worse person at the end. And he enters into the ninth gate of hell, right? Spoiler alert, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and, and all these people, I mean, he's just, um, he's very weaselly and, you know, all this stuff. Um, but he's like the chosen one to enter into the ninth gate of hell, which I'm not sure how that is a, a good thing. But Johnny Depp just talked about how, how these Hollywood films work. They start off by, you not liking something or you being won over by a character or a person, a celebrity, and then they go to the dark side. You know what happened with Miley Cyrus and Britney Spears when they were, you know, sort of a normal kid to, you know, people who watched Disney and watched uh, Hannah Montana and all these things. And then they went down this road of depravity and they took all their fans with them, right? The Kardashians, another example of this, right? They start off as being someone normal and then you, you identify with them as a fan, and then they take you into a, a road. They take you down a road of depravity. It is sort of the common man caught in a fantastical situation. I like to make movies that I would actually like to see as a... Yeah, so that tells you everything you need to know about him. Spectator. So he likes to make movies about Satanism. He's made two and one third one that I would call about Satanism as well. So I've seen um, three of his movies. I've seen little highlights of Rosemary's Baby. And I watched it, uh, you know, when I was a kid, some of it, whatever it was. And then that movie Carnage. And I don't know about his other movies, but 
I'm sure there's a satanic type of a, a vibe to him. So this is Johnny Depp. Um, the audio is not so great, but he is um, talking about Roman Polanski. So the guy asked him, um, Roman Polanski was arrested in Switzerland. So this is not that long ago. Um, this is after he worked with him before. Why now? <laughs> Why now? What's going I mean, obviously there's something going on somewhere and somebody had to make a deal with someone for something and maybe there's a little money involved. Are you talking about that time either you or Roman Polanski made a deal with the devil? Is that what, you, is that what you're referring to? I don't know, but why now? So he's not in favor of this guy who was convicted of being a pedo in America, being arrested in Switzerland or whatever it was. He's been going there for 30 years. No, no, I'm not saying that to you. I'm asking the question in general. For 30 years he's been going there. He has a place. He has a house there. You know, uh, um, especially the way they did it. Especially the they way they called did him it. to give him a lifetime of achievement, and then it's, it was in the end it was a trap to arrest. It was him. a trap, like the guy, the, you know, the poor innocent guy. He was trapped. They pretended to give him a award and they arrested him. How dare they? You know, how dare they arrest this convicted pedo? And also the thing is very clearly, very clearly, and he's proven this. Roman Polanski is not a predator. He's not a predator. He just. You know, plays one in life. I mean, he's a man, you know, he's 75 years old or what, or 76. He's got two beautiful kids. He's got a wife that he's been with for a long, long time. He's not... Uh, he's a good guy, said the guy with multiple skull rings and a bad history of self, right? He's not out in the street, you know, doing hor horrible things, so... He's just doing them behind closed doors. And so he supported this, you know, creepy pedo. So this is an article from GQ about um, Johnny Depp. I did a film with Roman Polanski, The Ninth Gate in Paris, with Vanessa. We were supposed to stay two months, and then we ended up staying two years. So that talked about how he went to Paris to work with Polanski, one of the few countries that would, you know, support him, even though he was, a, he was convicted of felony in America, but Johnny Depp still went there and then ended up living in France afterwards. So the, knife, so the Ninth Gate was made in um, 1999, so probably 1997. And 98 was when Johnny Depp worked on it. It was released in 1999. And Roman Polanski was convicted in 1977. So Johnny Depp worked with him years after that. And he completely backed Roman Polanski and supported him, right? And so that's one guy. Another guy was Hunter S. Thompson, who... Johnny Depp played uh, either Hunter S. Thompson or a character in one of his novels in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and also where he met Amber Heard with the Rum Diaries. And Hunter S. Thompson was a creepy m and -er, and Johnny Depp was, you know, I mean, he was um, a big fan of his, right? So this is the adrenochrome scene from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So this is Christina Ricci. Very twisted movie. I haven't seen this movie, but I've seen some scenes. So here she's some sort of high court talking about these two guys, Johnny Depp being one of them, and that she was given LSD by these guys. Very similar to what Roman Polanski was convicted of. And they took me to the hotel. I don't know what they done to me, but I remember it was horrible. So think about that, right? She didn't remember what they did to her, but she remembered it was horrible. Just a very similar situation with Roman Polanski, right? A known creep, Johnny Depp, who was associated with all these people. They gave you what? LSD. See? Just creepy and twisted. This is like, you know, I mean, just a, a horrible movie. So then they're about to go on the run, right? Um, you know, after whatever this accusation was, you just saw. And this happens. As your attorney, I advise you to take a hit out of the little brown bottle in my shaving kit. So what's in this brown bottle? Won't need much. Just a tiny taste. Adrenochrome. 
It's adrenochrome. Adrenochrome? Hmm. <laughs> so they have adrenochrome. This is Johnny Depp. You know, just the hero, all of a sudden, the hero of the truth community, taking the adrenochrome, promoting it in a pedo-friendly movie, a twisted, psychologically twisted, demonic, I mean, you could call this a, you know, some hellish version, uh, this is a version of hell in itself, this, you know, devil worshiper that's in these devil worshiping satanic movies, friends with these depraved Hollywood types, including Roman Polanski and Hunter S. Thompson and all the rest of them, right? Making twisted, you know, a twisted, dark, creepy internal world. What's inside of Johnny Depp, right? So as bad as Amber Heard might seem, how is he any better? I stomped him. So he takes a little adrenochrome. Then he takes some more. Anyway, the last thing in the world you want to do is call this hotel again. This is your hero here, Johnny Depp. And he takes some more. Then he gets weird like Johnny Depp do. He's just a strange, twisted m and and not in a good way. So when you look at this trial, the, the public trials, right, OJ trial being the big one, um, the trials that are on TV, right, uh, court situations that are on TV as opposed to, say, just lanes, you know, and some of these others, that when something's on TV like this and people are going to follow it, you know, there might even be like a documentary about it. I'm sure there'll be. Like people putting together documents. There are already documentaries on YouTube in a sense. But what you have is two professional actors in a trial that's on TV. So what, it's a TV show or a movie? Like well, a miniseries? What is it, right? Like why is it on TV? So it is literally a show, whether it's, you know, a real show or, a, uh, you know, I mean, it's at least partly a contrived show because they're acting, right? They're performing. That's what, you know, we've seen both of them doing right there. You know, they're performing for an audience, which is, you know, millions upon millions of people worldwide. And so whenever they put something on this show, right, whenever something is, you know, in the the big show that I call it, right, um, there's a reason for it. They, they're, you know, you're getting something. You're being sold something. You're being moved in one direction or another. You're being distracted. You're being... I mean, whatever reasons it's on, it has to do with you. Like you should say, all right, why am I seeing this? When you're watching anything, there's a reason why you're seeing it. And there's either, a, you know, there's always going to be some sort of agenda being pushed. Like when you're watching a movie and TV show, now everything has that liberal Hollywood morality agenda behind it. It's always had that, but now it's more obvious, right? They came out of the, the shadows and said, this is during the Trump era, right, during the Trump years. This is what we believe. This is what we believe about any number of issues, gender. This is what we believe about, you know, uh, women and, you know, all these various demographics. This is what we believe about men and, you know, their, you know, toxic max masculinity. This is what we believe about all of these things, right? This is what Hollywood believes. And this is what we want you now to believe, right? We've been putting it in movies and TV shows for years, but now we're coming out with it. This is our beliefs, and we knew that you guys wouldn't accept them, you know, on your own and whatever it is, and you weren't ready and whatever, you know. And now the Internet and Trump and just the way, you know, and it's for youthful people. Like you see, it's not for truthers. It's not for older people. It's for the young, right? And you can see it, you know, all across the board, so especially on social media. And kids are growing up leaving these things because... There's no parental relationship. Parents don't spend time with kids the way they used to. Kids are getting their beliefs from the internet. Like how many parents and kids even have conversations? And when they do, the kids are so far, um, you know, gone away from their parents. There's always been division. Like, you know, my generation and, you know, my parents' generation, um, there was just always division, starting with the 60s, you know, and the hippie movement. When parents and kids believe different things, right? Extremely different things. 
they were on the opposite sides of the the uh, left right paradigm just in general what we call conservatives right what we call in the conservative movement parents the older people get more conservative as they get older they get more fear based right where the younger generation gets more you know the liberal uh, becomes more liberal or is more liberal because they're angry right so anger turns to fear you know as you get older and the youth is angry and the old people are fearful and so this is generally the, the the way they shape the binary system that the liberals and the people on the left the democrats are for the angry youth and the so-called conservatives and the um, because they're not real liberals and conservatives, but the so-called conservatives and the Republicans are for the their older generation that's fearful, right? You listen to all the, I've said this stuff, the, the anger turns to, the, to fear and the fear turns to anger. The right uses fear and the left uses anger. The right uses fear that you're going to take their lifestyle and change everything. They have a fear of change, right? Make America great again. And so in that slogan, it's saying, We're bringing back the past, right? The future is going in a different direction than you want, and we're bringing back the past, right? Now, Jojo Magoo started off with no malarkey. He didn't really have a slogan. (laughs) He looked at it like, can anybody say what Jojo Magoo's slogan was after no malarkey? There was writing with Joe, right? I'm writing with Biden, I mean. There was that, and there was a bunch of other things um, that he said. But they weren't really unity, unity over division, battle for the nation of our soul, um, unite with us. So there was the, you know, Trump is dividing, we're uniting. But really, you know, nobody remembers those, right? <laughs> but Obama had Yes We Can, which was uh, Change We Need. Those were Obama's slogans, right? And Forward. And so that represents the left, that change has to happen. You know, usually... I mean, Trump ran as a change candidate in the sense that he was going to change the progression that was happening under Obama, and he was going to change it back to the past, right? And now Obama, and then uh, Biden ran as a change candidate, and so did, so did Obama. It's about progress. It's about moving forward. And it's this idea that the youth isn't going to have a seat at the table, that their, their future, their vision, the way they see the world is being stifled. And so that's the division in our country, the youth, the youthful movement, the anger of the youth that's being thwarted and, you know, they're not being acknowledged. They want their future, not their parents' future, right? Not their parents' present. They want their own future. And the parents and the older generation is withholding it from them, right? Okay, boomer, right? That's, you know, where all this stuff comes from. And even the sense of this step trial, you know, it's the, also the difference between the feminist movement, the male and female movement, all these things. And with the Depp trial, you have a much older Johnny Depp, who is an established person who's more successful, and he's been, you know, me too And then, you know, you have this, um, I mean, this is why appeal, he appeals to the truthers, that, you know, you have this young woman who looks like a scammer, who is playing a victim. She represents, you know, the more youthful generation and the the feminist movement, all these uh, liberal Hollywood ideals and things, and, you know, that she's somehow uh, manipulated her way into his life and ruined his life and reputation and career, and Johnny and Depp wants to, you know, make Depp great again, right? <laughs> you know, make Johnny great again. And so, um, you know, it's like just aligns with the divisions that are in their country, Right. But if you look at Johnny's relationship to um, these guys, Hunter S. Thompson, creepy dude, you know, and uh, why would people in the truth community align with somebody that was in a movie that literally talked about adrenochrome? I don't know if it's ever happened before. In a creepy, like, you know, just the character he played. I didn't see the movie, but just those clips I was watching. And you can see the whole clip. I mean, I edited it so I could use it, but it's... um. You know, all of it, his whole, you know, weird way of acting when he was on Adrenochrome and everything about it. And I'd seen, you know, the preview to the movie and, uh, you know, I knew what the movie was kind of one of these twisted movies where the person behaves in like they're in Alice in Wonderland where it's some psychedelic, uh, you know, distorted version of reality. It's almost like a horror film, right? 
and he has this you know relation with relationship with Hunter S. Thompson and uh, Roman Polanski, but all these other people. These he's with these deviant type of people, right? Marilyn Manson and all these rockers and people like that. And all these people have been, including Johnny Depp, I made many videos about him years ago and all these things, right? This twisted inner reality. And that's what this is about. Like, no matter what he is in this, whatever's going on, whether they were even legitimately married and this was it's the sham Hollywood marriage and this was part of a role that they're playing because these, you know, these celebrity these celebrities marry other famous people because it builds their brand, right? Being married to another famous person helps, you know, keep you, you know, people give you more attention, right? And that's what they always want is more attention. They want to stay relevant, you know, madam expiration date. And so, you know, whether this was ever a real marriage and this is just some sort of a scam, some sort of a show, or they legitimately were married and this was the drama that played out, and many of us have lived this kind of drama with, you know, people with personality disorders and people with psychological issues, and it sucks, right? It's just, you know, I mean, some of the things that are being said here are things that, you know, I certainly lived through some of the stories, right? And it just sucks. It sucks in an indescribable way because it's a condition. It's a spiritual condition, right? But the most important part is their internal worlds are on display, that's what I always bring everything back to. What are you inside? Because we don't know. When you're in relationships with people, you don't know what they have inside of them. You know, these are some scars I talk about in the Heartfulness Meditation. Like things come out of people when they're in a war. And I don't mean just like a divorce war here. But like when a country's in a war. I mean, you see this with soldiers. You have kids who are, you know, just been through this intensive mind control program. Our troops, our so-called troops, you know, they go through a mind control program. They get their, you know, their heads messed with in boot camp, right? And people have been through it. I mean, some are more extreme than others. I had friends in college that went through this. And, um, you know, the full metal jacket type of Marine uh, training. But my brother went through it for Vietnam and all these things. And they, you know, they mess with you, right? to turn you into a killer. And then they let these young men out who are, you know, in a war-torn civilization, a war-torn country, and they do bad things, and they come back to America, and it's like, you know, they're back in their suburban neighborhoods or whatever it is, right? And they can't adjust, right? They were in this extreme, extreme situation, and they got PTSD, and they come back, and, you know, People all say they love the troops, but now they're killers. Now they're people who, you know, other people fear, you know, and all these things. And so there's that. But then there's the people who are in that country. Like America hasn't been invaded, and that's going to change at some point. America is going to be under occupation, and, you know, our military won't be what it is now, all these things. And so at some point, America will be, or, you know, just being bombed. Like, you know, like England was bombed by Germany. It changes the way people think and see and, you know, feel about life. I mean, just living in fear of these types of things. And then the breakdown in civilization when there's a depression or there's an economic collapse. You know, we saw how people just went and everyone went and grabbed for themselves, right? Grab as much toilet paper and canned goods or whatever it was at the stores were depleted during the beginning of COVID. And then all of a sudden you see people, you know, in a post-apocalyptic situation, that things come out of them that were restrained by the, you know, the easiness of their life, right? Under stress, under conditions, you have things inside of you. They come out in, you know, marital divorce and things, right? They come out in, you know, stressful circumstances. And so you don't know what somebody has inside of them. They might be beautiful. They might be appealing on the outside, but what are they on the inside, right? And we know that Johnny Depp's insides he is twisted, like his art, you know, it's like Picasso. Picasso was a gifted artist in his ability to draw things, right? Like some people can, you know, just manipulate a, you know, a paintbrush and a, a pencil and produce wonderful art. But many people who have that ability have been either, you know, physically or sexually abused. It seems like lots of artists have been, the great artists have been traumatized. But Picasso's art that he produced was ugly. His insides were ugly. It was twisted. 
you know, one of his wife's wife's wives committed suicide because of the way that he drew her uglier and uglier over the years. And she eventually committed suicide. I mean, it's this kind of, you know, you look at Picasso's art and it makes you feel horrible inside. You know, there there's horror movies that are out there because that's what people have inside of them. And then there's devil worshiping movies because people have that inside of them. And the actors and the producers and the people who make them all have that in them. They have a, a predisposition to evil, right? They have evil inside of them and then it comes out in film and they put their evil on film and you know you see it over and over again and they're sharing their insides right and this is you know johnny depp and amber heard sharing their insides or whatever you know whatever in terms of even this is imaginary it's what they you know they thought up right you know it's their product as two you know dysfunctional people that had lots of money and lots of you know advantages and whether there was a real relationship or a fake one, this is what they came up with, right? This is the output that came from their inner worlds and what they're, you know, the twisted reality that they're putting on display for everyone else to be absorbed in, right? It's their filth being, you know, their dirty laundry, their inner filth being displayed in a courtroom situation. And when it's a competition, people root for things, right? <laughs> You know, they're going to root for one side or another. And that's, you know, so many things in America are competition. And so, and I'm not talking just about sports or even politics, but everything, you know, you're, you're on this team or that team. Remember there was, you know, the, the vampire um, movies, I remember they marketed, there was these two guys and you were either on team one guy or team other guy, I don't know the character's name, right? Are you on team this guy? Was one of them Jacob or something? <laughs> I'm on team Jacob, like this is the way. I'm on Team Depp, right? Well, why are you on Team Depp? Why are you even picking a side in this? I mean, why is it even of interest to you, right? If something funny happens, sure. Sometimes some kind of meme comes out. Like, you know, I, I watch very little of the... the I and mean, people were asking me, but I was busy doing other things. I was already had a backlog of videos. I had that video that took, um, you know, way longer than I thought it was, and it produced a backlog. And then... um. You know, I, I talked about that early video, but I knew what was, this was about and what it's always about is depravity. It's selfishness, right? Like who's not being selfish in this thing? Like who's the unselfish person? You know, who's the saint? Who's the giving person? Who's the person that wasn't in this relationship for themselves, right? I mean, the whole reason this court thing is happening is Johnny Depp is trying to save his career and whatever else, right? I mean, get even or whatever, you know, his motivation is here, right? It's not to walk away and, you know, be a good person and do good things in the world. You know, get away from it, right? That's what a, you know, good person would do. You just want to get away from it. You just want to, you know, sever your ties with the, you know, entity, the life-sucking entity, the succubus. When you're in a relationship with a succubus, then you just want to get away from the succubus. You don't want to go back in and double dip, right? Because now they're, you know, back in their relationship. It's just more, I mean, it's more solidified now because it involves the public and all these things. Rehashing all these stories, right? For what? So people will believe you. I mean, that's what this is about. People would believe your side. I mean, that's what this, you know, fake or real, this is what it's about. Believing your side of the story. Because, you know, I personally have gone through this kind of, you know, not just with this, with other things in my life and, why do I care if people believe my side of the story, right? I mean, it's going to change, like, I'm not going to hang out with somebody who, who believes bad things about me. Not that I'm some, you know, I consider myself a great person. But, you know, someone who's mirroring back bad things about you, you start to believe those bad things, right? That's why your parents, when your parents look at you as like a bad kid or a bad person, you have to like end up getting away from them because... You know, and whatever truth there is in that, yeah, you have to confront that. You have to look at the, be honest about the things people are saying to you that are true because you have to change. When you have, you know, things mirrored back to you, right? Uh, for me, it was like when I started interacting with my brother and my parents after years of not talking to them. And I realized that some of the characteristics that I didn't like about them were things that. I also had, right? Your family members also, you know, share some things that, you know, be, became were normal for you. 
not became, but you grew up with it, with them being normal. Dysfunctional, dysfunctional ways that your family behaved. There was just, you know, a negativity in my family. I brought my kids back, and some of my nieces and nephews who were older were uh, sort of teasing my kids the way, you know, I'm like, oh, it's a Romano thing, right? And I just remembered what it was like in my family, and I was like, uh, you know, there were things I just wanted to be away from and shed and things that I still carried with me in myself, right? And so when you get things mirrored back on you, you know, to you that are things that are inside of you that are bad for you that you don't know about and bad for society and whatever, right, other people that you interact with, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I got to change those things. And then you find out a way. I mean, there's the cleaning process and the heartfulness system, but also, you know, being conscious of these things and finding ways to, you know, like reprogram yourself to do more, you know, to be more functional, to be more, you know, a better person. So that's, you know, where criticism can be a good thing if people get it right. But if people make things up about you, you know, that have to do with them because they need you to be a certain way and they put that on you and you're, it's not true and you stick around, eventually it will be true and you'll absorb those things. That's why when people are critical of me in a way, especially if it's, you know, not based in truth, but if they see you in a certain way, they see you in a certain light, then you're going to, you know, you're going to absorb their viewpoint of, the, of you. It'll, it's reflecting in, into your internal world and you're going to, you know, you're going to become what they think you are, right? Especially if it's your significant other. If your significant other is, uh, you know, a, a victim abuser, a person who is a perennial victim, and they need an abuser in their life, eventually they're going to pull that out of you. They're going to want you to, you know, play that role for them. You know, people have these imaginary realities of, you know, a role that they're playing, and they'll structure their social circumstances where they're constantly being a victim, for example, or constantly being somebody with power that uses their power to enforce their, you know, their beliefs and, and will on other people, right? And they'll you know, bend those people through manipulation and intimidation where the people who are victims will find your vulnerabilities, find your, you know, weaknesses, find your things that are, um, you know, triggers for you. And they'll, they'll flick those buttons and provoke you into such an extent that you react in a way and then they'll escalate the situation and they'll frame these, you know, interactions that they're creating where they're being the aggressor, where they're you know, literally going into your internal world and, you know, provoking you in some way so that they can be the, they can cast themselves as a victim role, right? They ignore all the things that they do to provoke the situation, right? You know, when there's hate in a relationship, it's pulling out the hate that's inside of you, right? You remove the hate and then you don't have a relationship with a person like that, right? If you get rid of the anger and you get rid of the fear in your system, then, you know, of course there's going to be some natural anger and natural fear. There's some, you know, appropriate reactions, a fearful reaction when, you know, you're under threat. I mean, there's biological responses here. But I'm talking about all the psychologically, you know, twisted um, things that are there, all the phobias, all the, you know, all these types of things. But when you're in a relationship where there's just negativity abounds, you remove those things in yourself. You find out the things that brought you into that relationship. Why was I in this relationship with this person? And there's reasons like this is what I, you know, did with my ex, right? The heartfulness system cleaned out the reasons I was in that relationship, right? The things that I needed in that relationship that were dysfunctional and needed to experience because of my personal samskaras. And when they were cleaned out, then I could have something more functional like I have now, right? Something that's, you know, it's, it's a real relationship where there's positivity and, you know, mutual benefit and things. But, you know, people are attracted to what they need, right? And whatever it is. And if it's bad, if you have, you know, several relationships with abusive people, are you still thinking you're the victim? Or is there something inside of you that's attracting you to people like that, right? Like you're going to have the same relationships over and over again. You know, in a, you know India, I mean, there's such a conservative view. Uh, master charge you, the third master of the heartfulness system you know, about marriage and, you know, this arranged marriage, which, I mean, it works because of their attitudes towards it, you know, that they don't fall in love like in America, they're maybe sometimes hardly know each other. 
I mean, there were times where somebody would come up to Master Charger. You'd be sitting with a group of people, you know, holding court. And some woman would come up and say, a young woman, say, I need a husband. And he'd look through the crowd and point to some guy. He goes, there's your husband there, right? <laughs> you know, and for Westerners, it just, they couldn't, I mean, that was too much. Like, you would never, you know. But for them, they had faith in it. I met a few Indian couples that had had successful marriages that were completely different states, completely different castes and languages. Their families didn't get along. But they had faith in Master Chargy and him arranging the marriage, and they made it work. They had to change their cultural views on things. I mean, it was, you know, quite interesting uh, conversations of what these people went through to make their marriage successful, right? But you have to have an attitude of faith and, you know, you have to be, you know, whatever, positive people. You know, but there's so many people that they have the same relationship over and over again. And Master Chargy met this guy who was an older guy. And he had heard about the guy, you know, and he had had four marriages, which in India is, you know, not the norm, right? Especially for those generations. He was a rich guy and he was about to get married for his fourth time. And, you know, Master Chargy said, you know, why wouldn't you just realize it isn't going to work out for you? You know, like after the third time, you know, especially if it's the same person. If you marry the same person, even though it's a different person, and it's the same dynamics in the relationship, then, you know, you need to change something in yourself, right? There needs to be some change. The preceptor I went to, um, the guy who started me, told you this story. Like, he was one of the few people. Like, most of the people who do heartfulness never really went to Babaji's house. I mean, the people who do it now. Babaji passed away in 1983. So that's, you know, what is that, 40 years ago. And so there's very few people who knew Babaji. You know, that are left. Dodgy, the current master of the system. Uh, you know, he was 18, I think, when... Uh, or 19 when Babaji passed away, and he, I think he met him a couple of times. Uh, but this guy, um, you know, went to Babaji's house, and there wasn't so many people that traveled all the way to Shah Jahanpur, so it was, you know, I was lucky to have this guy because he told me a lot of good stories about his trips to India. And he went to Babaji, and, you know, he wanted to get married, right? So he brought these various pictures of girls he was dating, right? He was in the, the 60s, you know, a hippie. And he showed these pictures of women to Babaji, you know, and, and this one woman in particular, he said, Babaji looked at it and he just slammed the girl, like just said, and Babaji always saw the good in people. He didn't, you know, if he saw the bad, he dismissed it and look at it. He was, it was something to be cleaned away. Right. But he said all these things about this young woman and, and this guy, Fred said, you know, everything that he said ended up turning out to be true. You know, he returned to America and he was, um, you know, the relationship played out, and he was like, oh, <laughs> you know, Babaji, everything he said was right, you know, the, about this person. She turned out to be like a horrible person. But at the end of that interaction, when Babaji said all these things about this woman, he looked at Fred and said, I can clean your marriage some scars for you. You know, his marriage some scars. And Fred said, no. And I said, you know, and I was listening to the story, and I said, you know, he didn't mean you weren't going to get married. He meant that the, you know, the heaviness, the, the dysfunction in your, you know, your marriage, you know, your marital some scars, like everyone has them, your relationship, some scars, impressions would be cleaned away. And he said, yeah, I know that now. You know, I was a new person, but there was more information available. And so Fred didn't understand what he was talking about and thought, oh, I'm not going to get married. Oh, I want to get married. Don't clean those, right? But really what Babaji was saying was, he wanted to purify his marriage of scars. And Fred had a number of nightmare relationships. He got married to a woman. They were married for like eight hours. You know, they, they, and it was annulled. I mean, they are married by Master Chargy. And I mean, just, um, you know, there was the legal, you had to get legally married. But Master Chargy, you know, you see this on Sunday, Dodgy does like, a, you know, a spiritual marriage where there's uh, some spiritual work done where the couple is given a special sitting to, like, weave their hearts together or whatever it is, right? You can, you know, look at it like they have those um, those necklaces where there's, like, half a heart, and each person in the couple has, a, like, a half a heart, and they come together and it fits together. But in most circumstances, the, the half of the heart, and, you know, it's not... I mean, splitting a heart in half, I think it's a bad idea. It's a bad metaphor, right? 
because you both have your own hearts. I don't know. It's stupid. But anyways, just this idea this uh, of these two things that fit together, usually they fit together in their dysfunction, right? That's how most American relationships are. There's dysfunction on both sides. And, you know, you go about trying to fix the other person, right? <laughs> I mean, it's more for women than men, but uh, both people try to get the other person's dysfunction to, you know, change the other person's dysfunction to accommodate theirs. But most people don't want to change themselves or see what they have to change. They just have their myopic side point of view. But when you go through a divorce process, you got to figure out what's inside of you that drew you to that relationship, right? What's inside of you that drew you to such a dysfunctional person? Why did you need to experience this? It's not an accident. You're not a victim. Like, you know, why are you in this relationship? I and mean, you don't see either Amber Heard or Johnny Depp even, you know, having that as a, you know, giving that a sniff, right? That's not there. Neither one of them's trying to figure out that like, there's a, you know, if you think about God sending you a person to marry and you marry that person and the person turns out to be a nightmare, which almost inevitably happens. Why is that, right? Why did you deserve that? Why, why did your soul choose to experience that? You know, in the heartfulness system, why did, you know, God, why did the, you know, master within send this to you, right? Because everything's coming from God. You know, why this person? Why am I experiencing this? What's inside of me? You know, like I said, if your hate's inside of you, your object of your hate is whatever it is. Your, you know, it could be a racial group, it could be a demographic, it could be a party, it could be Joe Biden, it could be Donald Trump, right? It could be any number of people. Or, you know, your spouse, right? Why do you hate? You know, why is the object of your hate is where your hate is generated or focused on, but the hate is inside you, inside your internal world, right? And so, you know, get rid of it. So you don't, you know, you're not in hateful relationships. I mean, when you remove your hate, you remove your, you know, all the negative things inside of yourself, then the world becomes a much different place, right? You see people who suck, you see the, you know, whatever's inside of them, but you, there's no, you know, venom inside of you to, you don't really care, right? It's, it doesn't matter, you know, like I see people suck all the time and I don't feel hateful for them. Like, you know, they're hateable, but why, you know, why would that make me feel good, right? Like I had this bitterness inside of me that was pulled out. I talked about this in so many videos. Talk about a lot in the journey series. There's this bitterness towards God and it just the way it felt to be me, you know, and that was something that was pulled out during the relationship and some of these interactions with, you know, Dodgy and these, you know, people and you know, things were going on in the heartfulness system while I was in India and it was removed. I was like, Oh my God, I feel so much better. Like I just it was transformational and my life got better and everything got better from that cleaning, right? It took years, 18 years and, you know, I mean, whatever, 20 years of being a, a practitioner of the heartfulness system. It was a deep impression and when it was removed, I was like, oh, like this is what it feels like not to have that burden that I was carrying around, the bitterness that you feel, right? This idea that being resentful to somebody is like swallowing a poison pill and expecting the other person to die, right? Like you feel the resentful, you feel the hate. It sucks to feel hate. It sucks to feel resentful. It sucks to wake up and feel hopeless and negative and angry towards the world, right? And that's so many truthers who just look at this in a fear-based, anger-based way and they project their hate and their anger on, you know, this group or that group or, you know, the, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it is, Joe Biden or whatever it is, right? Johnny Depp or Amber Heard and, you know, just needing to hate somebody, needing to, you know, spit venom at people, needing to, you know, and then going out and commenting and, you know, saying all these things. Oh, this person's such a horrible person, right? Yeah, but what about you? Like, why do you, like, why are you indulging in this? Why are you indulging in this negativity fest, right? Why do you want to feel that way? Like, how does this make you feel when you watch the Johnny Depp uh, Amber Heard trial? How does it make you feel when you watch hours and hours of Joe Biden you know, and you just hate them and you feel angry and you just whatever. Or Kamala Harris or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or, you know, like just feeling bad and miserable. Like all the people who are obsessed with Trump on the left, right? They're hate fest, the people on CNN. They just can't. Well, why, why are you still talking about him? Like he was president. That's why you were upset. This guy should never be president. But now 
why are you still obsessed with him? Why are you still talking about how bad Donald Trump is, right? Because it's inside of you. You know, it's not the Trump that's outside isn't the real Trump for you. The real Trump is inside you, right? You know, the the Trump that you need in your existence. Why don't you throw the Trump out that's inside of you and focused on moving forward in some way, right? There's a new president, but you're still caught in, you know, hate-filled Trump land. I mean, you can say that about pretty much everybody. Like, just, you know, move on. Like, people think, you know, I get obsessed with celebrities or people I cover, you know, and I, I cover them because it's, you know, easier for me. And it usually, you know, there's some, I mean... Well, at some point, like, I'm not going to make videos about this trial, right? Hopefully this is the last one for me. Like, I'm always moving, wanting to move forward to something else, right? But starting something else, I have to invest in that universe, invest in the storyline. I have to feel the, you know, the conditions there, the people and the circumstance, right? So it's always better to, you know, for easier for me to do something I already know about. I already, you know, have some sense about it, right? Because it's all the same to me. It's just a mess. It's people failing in a system that's failing because it's based in materiality and egoism and selfishness and, you know, and it's just time for it to fail. When there's something better, you know, focusing on God and connecting to God and find, finding your soul's path and taking a, or an attitude of service, I mean, that's the, the next thing. That's the, the thing that, you know, people can choose. Will they? I don't know, right? I mean, the heartfulness meditation is the, you know, the, the tool that's being given for people to choose to you know, connect to God on a deeper level, connect to their soul, you know, minimize their egos, and move towards this um, service-orientated existence. And will people do it? Hey, I hope so, right? I mean, right now it doesn't look like it, but, you know, things are going to happen that are going to you know, make it uh, tilt the scales a little bit. Right now, the scales are tilted towards being selfish, being a sociopath, being a narcissist, and being, you know, you, you're going to be successful, you know, in terms of your materialistic pursuits. And so right now, the, the way society works, the way the world works, being that way, it's good for you, right? So it pulls out lower level characteristics and behaviors, but things are going to switch in such a way that being like that is going to be you know, you're going to have it, it's going to be impossible to survive, right? People who are like, you know, negative in their orientation, we just won't be able, everything will just come back and hit them immediately. Their lies, their anger, their hate, their all these things will be, you know, reflected back at them in a much quicker way than it is now. And so you won't be able to survive in the world being the way that would make you successful in today's world. And that's going to switch. And when that does switch, then there'll be, you know, uh, a push towards being a more spiritual, more loving, a more godly person. I mean, that's the only way you'll be able to survive. And so, you know, when that happens, we'll see how people respond because they still might fight that, right? You know, because people have a human beings, uh, the human beings that are here, all of us right now are predisposed towards the darkness, towards the negative, unfortunately, towards the drama. I mean, that's part of the Kali Yuga, but also you know, being a, a slave race that was manufactured with a lot of anger and hate and victim consciousness and warrior tendencies and things that wasn't, you know, that wasn't, wasn't created to be spiritual, wasn't created to be, we have a higher nature, but that isn't the focus of our, you know, genetic makeup right now. So those things have to be reversed and we'll see if it happens. But anyways, you know, <laughs> You know, Johnny Depp isn't the person that, you know, he, he isn't the hero that he's being portrayed as. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramato, definitely important for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.